my name's Matt, welcome back to the shop, and I want to uh, do a series about um, complexity, simplicity, mass manufacture, and blah, 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 blah. There is a big difference um, between simplicity and complexity. It can be the design, it can be the physics, or it can be the manufacturing. And people just chuck around that statement so much. Engineering is not about getting the most simple thing ever, right? Because otherwise, a jet engine wouldn't exist, right? The piston engine did the job, you know what I mean? It's, yeah, it's not about that. For instance, the R1 crankshaft is one piece. It's one part, just like this. So this is, uh, we're going to get to what this is in a minute, but it's a crankshaft. And this is one piece, one piece of steel, and uh, R1 cross-plane crankshaft is one piece. But the R1 crankshaft is extremely complicated, right? It has no uh, no symmetry whatsoever. You cannot, there is no symmetrical part of that crankshaft. It is just fucked, right? Where if you split right down the middle, for instance, right down there like that, this is symmetrical, and I can prove it because I've actually even mirrored the whole thing, right? Uh, just to make sure it is symmetrical. So this has uh, a plane of symmetry, right? The and this has actually has another plane of symmetry. Almost, if you cut it down there, right down the middle, these throws are the same. The ends aren't, but that's an example of not symmetrical. The R1 crankshaft, the cross-plane crankshaft, is not symmetrical in any which way you slice it at all, even down the middle. And that's not just because it's a cross plane. Each individual counterweight is different. And I mean, each individual counterweight is different than the other ones. It is, but regardless, it's a very complicated design because it's a very complicated um, rotating mass to balance. Regardless, let's get on with what this is all about. So what I want to do is I want to show you the simplicity of a crankshaft, right? And it, it's it's very simple manufacturing-wise because they've built all the machines that do it and we've been doing it for a long time, yes. But it, even then, it's still simple, right? And this, in part one, I'm just gonna show you a crankshaft and what ha you have to do to manufacture one of these to a degree. And then what we're going to do is we're going to look at other engine designs um, because you know that's what I've been doing lately is look at, over looking at concept designs and stuff. And when I see them, I immediately say, "God, fucking hell, that's complicated." And people don't understand what I mean, or I'm not defining exactly what I mean. So I want to put some meat on them bones. So the first thing is, is this is a model of a. It's a very crude model. It's a model of a, a forged crankshaft, and this is after it comes out of the forging process. But to get across exactly how we even get here, I wanna show you a video. Right, so what we've got here is we've got a, um, a forged bar of steel. So this has already been squashed down like you would with a hammer, an anvil kind of thing. This um, billet, in a sense, has been squashed down already. So the first thing you have is you have a preliminary or a pre-forging die, which is that one, which gives you about the right shape. Um, and then what you do is you have a second, there's several stages, this has three, but there's like kind of like an almost a preliminary three, uh, a, a, a preliminary stage, this second stage, that bang there, and this is what we call drop forging, because it doesn't squish, it just uses basically momentum of the massive weight um, just to forge it into a die, right? Just squashes it in like that. And as you can see, it bounced, right? So the next thing is, is the computer moves it over and then this is what you call a trimming and calibration die. So basically what this is, is this now squishes this shape and you'll notice that the pressing is different. It comes down, locks down, and then applies a pressure to it. And what that does is that forces it through this die. You can see the squirts of uh, nitrogen gas there. Usually that's to cool down the die itself. But basically, it's fallen through um, this. It's like a, cook, a, cutty, a, a cookie cutter. And basically what's happened there is 
is it's a calibration die because once it's cut it free from the flashing, which is that squished out shite, if it's the wrong size, it won't fall through the die. So that's the calibration bit. It's falling through the cookie cutter, basically, and obviously just trimming off the flashing, which is the squished out material because it has to go somewhere, right? You can only squash this and compress this so much. And then this final operation here, this is, a, uh, this is temperature control, right? So now what they want to do is they want to control the, the cooling. This is all about crystal growth, and they just want to try and make it even because it's still got a lot of residual heat. You can see it glowing. And then this machine here, all this is doing is what you call warm straightening. It's still warm is this crankshaft, and once you measure it, you can literally push on it and just tweak it before it cools. So what we've basically seen is this process. You have your stock material. That stock material is then forged down. This is kind of like your preforming, or this section is your preforming. There's different, uh, depends what steel you use and what operation it's for and exactly what your crankshaft is going to be used for and what steel. It does determine the amount of operations. But basically, you call this end preforming. You call the, or no, let's just call these two preforming. Um, and then you've got your uh, original drop forge, your second drop forge, and then you've got your trim in there. You can see where it's just been cut away. This flashing has been cut away. And then you've got your product at the end, um, which is basically where I want to start. This is a not the best picture in the world, but that's a picture of a die. So what you've got there is you've got this outer, you know, the actual form that you want. And I want to do some things with some plasticine and some 3D prints to show you the process in a way. Then you've got basically holes and alignment, dowels and stuff like that, just to make sure everything doesn't buckle and everything stays the way it should. Absolutely fantastic. So what we're left with is this. So this will be done. Uh, it can be done in-house um, or it can be done at one factory so they can do the forging and then do the temperature control and the, the heat straightening or the warm straightening, stuff like that. You can also do uh, heat treatments. You can go through um, normalizing heat cycles. There's a lot of things you can do, inspection, so on and so forth. Um, but you can actually just ship these like this to a factory, right? Um, you know, a machine shop part of the factory kind of thing. So that's what we've kind of got here. Um, and... One of the first things you want to do in this process, because we're going to start sticking this in a CNC or whatever, or you know, like, yeah, it's a CNC, a CNC machine or whatever. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to go through the processes. So you can have a flashing removal stage, which is this one. So you'll see there that when I cut this on SolidWorks, it's going to be shiny metal underneath instead of this grey, darky, forged finish, um, which you'll see in a lot of crankshafts. And you can grind this. There's several ways. Some stations have grinders where they don't grind the entire thing. They just grind it in key locations. And uh, like just say here, right here, this section here, they'll grind it along there and obviously along the other one, that kind of thing, stuff like that. Where other places they'll leave it because it's going to get cut anyway. Um, so that's, you know, that's one stage. You can either grind it um, CNC or it depends if you have a really good forging process where it can literally just cut it down to that it's just something I wanted to point out that sometimes they grind this instead of um, you know for forcing it through another die set any road so the next thing we need to do is we want to cut a main journal so I'll show you what that looks like just on one so there we go so basically a tool we, we get this between centers and a tool just comes in like this, and this thing's spinning, you just cut along this side, and then because you're programming, you come out, and then you cut across this side, then you'll cut a radius, then you'll cut across the main journal. Now, usually what happens is, is sometimes that the, this is a giant big tool with, and it'll do, it's, it's, a tool, it's a tool change post, so basically you have multiple tools, but they can have a giant wheel so a giant wheel like this that comes in and it basically just cuts this side, you know, and this side, obviously, obviously the thing's spinning. So it just does a rough cut. And then there's a tool that comes in and does the radius 
this thrusting face, that surface, your main journal diameter, that face and that face, where this face will be different. But you can see what's going on here. Basically, we're just forcing a tool and cutting out all of this rough stock that's excess. And you can see the difference between here, how fat this is and how much we've taken out of there like that. Then we, you know, it repeats the process so we've got all of them done like that. And it's coming and it's just basically doing the throws. So it's cut this surface and this surface and a bit of the main journal, that kind of thing. So you'd have something like this. I haven't put the centers in, you can just imagine that, right? Um, so that's what we've done. And then the next thing is we'll do a uh, the crank pins. So the crank pins, you know, the crank pins are here. You can see how they're just blobby and rough and all that kind of jazz. And when we cut into that, like so, you can see now we've cut the main journals. Now when we do this, we can't spin this on center. A lot of CNC machines can move both, or the head moves, yeah, just stuff like that. Or you can actually, uh, you have an offset chuck that basically, an eccentric chuck that grabs it out here. So it's the center line of your bearings and you turn it and you grab it the other way, you turn it and you grab the other one. So that's the main pins done. And then these main pins will be done next, the outer ones. Um, usually they're do, done individually, but as you'll notice, if we just go back a second, as you notice, this surface inside here is rough and we need to get to this. So basically, it's, it's the same kind of process you do when you do your main journals. If you watch it happen like that, it just cleans up all of that. Right, so already we're getting something that looks like we'd imagine. And then what we need to do is a lot of times is they want to cut this out of diameter. Right, you'll see they want to cut that out of diameter. Before I move on, I want to show you, you can see on these surfaces here, on your actual throws, if you look at actual uh, crankshafts, so this is a Ducati crankshaft, you can see the tool marks. So these lines across here on this Ducati crank, this is the you know this is our main journal here. That's the radius in there. These lines, these deep scores, because it's a really rough cutter, it needs to plow on and not fuck about. So it really plows on in there. You can also see the shiny side of the outer throw there, that diameter. Um, same with the R1 here. This is the R1 crankshaft. They're taking the time a bit more, and obviously they're, they're literally just, um, you can just see the turning marks, you know what I mean? So they've got a single point tool in here. Instead of a real rough in mill, it just bats its way through like the Ducati one. Um, it really doesn't matter, this is the thing. If it gets cut, it gets cut, right? If you bang in there and it looks, you know, concentric rings like this compared to the Ducati one, at the end of the day, as long as it's cut, it doesn't really matter. These striations aren't going to really make that much of a difference, you know, how deep these grooves are or aren't, you know what I mean, that kind of thing. But that's just showing it as they come in, right? Um, once we've done that, we can, like I say, we cut the outer diameter. So this section here, we're going to cut that. So we're just going to cut that there. Um, and these are in order, right? So you could start with your crank pins first because they're offset. And then as soon as you've done that, stick it between centers and away you bloody go. You know what I mean? Um, or like I say, not between centers, the chuck can have two positions where it has concentric with the center of rotation and then concentric with this and then this. It just depends. Or if the head moves and the, you know, you just follow, trace the circle, that kind of thing. Uh, quickly finish off the crank nose and the crank end, we'll get that done in the chamfers. So all these ends just get chamfered, you know, stuff like that. And then we'll do the cross drilling. So to show you the cross drilling, um, I'll just show you one there. You'll just see a hole magically appears here, all right? So what happens is, is a big drill bit, a big fucking long one comes in here and cuts right through the center and comes out this side here, all right? So it's going right through the lot. If I undo that, like so, do a cross section instead, it's so like this, so as imagine we could see inside this crank, um, as this happens, we cut through like, oh, the deal. There we go. It just shits itself a bit. So you can see that we've cross drilled all the way through, just a nice straight hole. We'll do the second one like that, it just blanks out because it doesn't know the fuck is, what the hell's going on. So you can see it's just cross drilled through there as well. So just two cross drills for this crankshaft. Right, absolutely wonderful. 
And then what you need to do is, the reason why they call it cross drilling, actually let's go back to the, the cut through. The reason why they call it, call it cross drilling is because it literally needs to cross, these points need to cross, right? This is going out the side of a throw and out the side of the throw, that's no good. And the feeds are from the main journals. So the feeds are from here, oh good deal, and there, and there, possibly this one, possibly this one, depending on the design, right? So it's coming from there. So we do the pin drills. So the pin drills, you won't see them here, but if we turn this off, they're there, you see, we've just gone through the pins. And we've gone straight through both sides. They don't always have to go straight through both sides. Some are at 30 degrees, this is at 90 degrees, some are at 45, just depends on the design. I'm just keeping this simple. Um, so you know that's what you do. You you do your cross pinning like that across your pins, and then you do your main journal drilling, which would be straight down like that, right? So it's crossing. You see how the paths are crossing, right? So you've got the pins there that cross. These cross here. So the oil from your main bearings comes through your bearing, comes through this hole, travels up here, and then out your pins. And you might be thinking, well, surely it just starts squirting out the side. They can usually dr drill a, a larger diameter bore in there, ever so slightly larger, another millimetre, then you force a ball bearing in. Um, and then after we've done that, you know, you do stuff like um, drilling and tapping the nose, stuff like that. Right, and that, uh, apart from some maybe some grinding on your, your journals are almost there, you do some grinding and polishing, you might do additional heat treatment, nitride, and you might do all sorts. You usually do that, or you can do that now, and then do the polishing and grinding to get to your absolute diameters later on. Blah, blah, blah. This then goes off to be measured, stuff like that, and then eventually be stuck in a crankshaft. Now, this might seem like an awful lot of processing, but it's not, because really, all we've got, if I can grab that, all we've got is we start off here, and then we just zip through some machining processes like this, which are all quite, they're all turning processes. It's all done by computer. It's all very accurate. It just, it just zip, 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 depending on how it does it. Usually it does main journals and then pins, that kind of thing. And then after that, it's just a load of drilling operations. You drill straight through, come, Pull it, retract the drill, that's it. Drill straight through, drill straight through. There's some chamfering operations sometimes, it, but it's it's not much. It's just and you know, using a chamfering tool, um, it's just it's just another drill bit. You know what I mean? It's like drilling and tapping. You drill it and then you tap it and then you chamfer it. It's that's it, right? That's it. And this is the most key component of your of your engine. You know, it's one of the three. Right, you have crankshafts, you have con rods, and you have pistons. Right, for getting the head of the base, the core engine. This is piss easy. Right, it's actually cylinder heads where it gets a bit more, com a hell of a lot more complicated. There's a hell of a lot more processes with cylinder heads, but um, you know this is basically it. Right, so every time you look at engine designs, and I'm, I'm, I'm building the model for it, so I'll be able to show you. Um, you look at these new designs that have cylinder heads, pistons, but they change the bottom end in some kind of respect, right? And you see all oh, the amount of stuff you have to do. You know, some of them, you have this and then just additional extras. And it's like, for what? And they're like, oh, well, we've done testing. It's 7% more efficient. It's like, no one is going to go for that. No one is going to bin the process they have for this. This is one of the problems, um, not problems, but one of the initial problems with the Wankel was the fact is that you had to pretty much retool. Apart, there is the eccentric shaft, but you pretty much had to retool to make housings, rotors, seals. Everything wasn't transferable just instantly. Where the, we've been doing this for a long time with crankshafts, you know, they've been a, a, around forever as far as engines are concerned. You know, they've been there from the beginning. And, you know, you watch, I've made some model ones uh, for the channel a couple of years back. Out of anything, you know, there's people on YouTube making model 
engines and stuff and this that, and the other. And these are easy to turn, right? They're easy to turn. You've seen, I'm sure you've all seen countless videos on CNC billet machining of crankshafts. It, it's it, it's just a it's just a turning operation pretty much. You'll notice I've added some little things in here. You'll notice, or hopefully you've noticed, because I did actually go out my way to do it, um, that these two don't look exactly the same. You will see that with crankshafts. All right, I've got to turn perspective off. That might help. Turn that off. You might notice, I'll just put the lines on as well, so it's even easier. You might notice that this is a bit broader than this one, right? You might notice on your crankshafts that this is a square edge where this one has a slight radius to it. I actually went out of my way to type in some little dodgy numbers into this. That they're not all equal, right? They're not perfect. The spacings between all these operations are perfect, but the crankshaft might be in or out by a millimetre or a half a millimetre or something like that. You know what I mean? It's like, look, here you can see it here. All these journals are exactly the same diameter. You can see there that this line, that line, is nearly to the apex there, where this line there is miles away, right? This happens. You will see, you'll see it in crankshafts where it's not entirely perfect, right? The spacings are, like I say, the journals are, but the actual, where it cuts out, there's another example. You can see that we've got an edge there. I haven't done this, look, you can see we've got an edge there, right? And on this one right next to it, it's tiny compared to that one. It's just offset, you know what I mean? And you can see where the forged line was here. You can see this ridge, this ridge here. Um, and that's basically where the metal's allowed to squish out to deform into, um, you know, where they put these cuts, it isn't exactly a full circle. It doesn't, it's not perfect, right? It is mass manufactured. And when I say stuff like about Koenigseggs um, or free valves, free valve, God, the precision you need. And you want to pump out millions of them. It's taken us this long to get this good at doing 16 valves. Um, you know what I mean? It, it's just difficult, very difficult to get the tolerances you need and so on and so forth. Any road, so that's just part one. In part two, I'm going to show you the other operation for, or the comparison operation of a design of the difference between making something simple and making something difficult. Sometimes it could just be more steps, but other times it can be, ah, this is really fucking difficult to do and get right. Um, it's like the uh, helical cam. It's not as easy as camshafts. To prove it, I'm going to show you, I'll do the same thing here. Back to back, I'll show you a camshaft versus a helical cam. And it's just difficult, just difficult. Hope that makes sense. And I'll see you in a bit.